Dr. Contrado. <clears throat> They'll basically say that uh, can the patients expect to be pretty much pain-free after surgery, you think? The, the benefits that this have are tremendous. Obviously, you can never guarantee someone that they're going to be 100% pain-free. What we explain to the patient is that typically using this block, instead of, and we use a numeric pain scale in the hospital, rating pain from 1, or that is hardly perceptible at all, to 10, being the worst pain they can imagine. Typically, the pain is often at an 8 to 9 level after this type of surgery, but with an effective lumbar plexus block, more typically, it's at a 2 or a 3. And using the other oral co-analgesic medications that we talked about, the pain is extremely well uh, managed and patients are very satisfied. That's encouraging. So the post-op pain management that you and your department are doing, does that differ from other centers in the region? Uh, we are unique within central Wisconsin with this type of program. Um, these are much more advanced techniques of regional anesthesia, uh, the type of training that requires fellowship level of training and is not typically found in many areas throughout the United States and in Wisconsin. We're very fortunate at St. Joseph's Hospital Marshfield Clinic to have a group of individuals who are skilled in these types of techniques so that we can consistently offer this type of pain relief to patients postoperatively. Typically, you only find this at hospitals that are associated with teaching centers or research centers, but at the Marshfield Clinic, we have actually uh, generated a very large regional anesthesia program, and it's probably the largest in the state at this time. Thank you. Dr. Simonstead, uh, what role does the pain management uh, play in, in recovery for your hip uh, surgery? It's a very integral role. Uh, patients that are not having significant pain after surgery are able to participate in physical therapy much more readily. They're much more satisfied with their hospital stay. And lastly, many of these patients are probably able to go home much sooner, some of them as soon as two days after surgery and many within three, um, mainly because of this pain management program that Dr. Conorado outlined. Uh, what is re rehabilitation following surgery, both the flip procedure with resurfacing and then the, uh, uh, with, uh, with the, the flip procedure and uh, the impingement surgery? Well, because of the trochanteric flip osteotomy needs to heal, um, we actually do recommend about toe-touch weight-bearing for the first six weeks so that the hip abductors don't see too much stress. But once they're healed then we allow all, any activity um, as the patients uh, can return to completely normal activity at that point. That's great. Uh, Dr. Kenny, uh, you are a radiologist and you see a lot of hip x-ray on a daily basis and you must often see quite a few hip impingement. How often is it to see a hip impingement when you look at a surgery, uh, look at x-rays and uh, do you think all of them are symptomatic? Do they have pain? Um, it's very common when we look at x-rays of patients with hip pain that they do have those abnormal shapes. Either the head is abnormal or the socket's abnormal. But it's important in, in making the diagnosis of actually the whole impingement syndrome that we also you know, strongly consider the patient's clinical scenario. Um, you can imagine a patient may have an abnormally shaped head or socket where they may in general be predisposed to having impingement, but if they're not very active, they're not going to bring about that pathology. Whereas another patient with relatively subtle changes, if they're very active, cycling or playing hockey or something, uh, they might have a lot of, a lot of uh, symptoms. So um, we do see it very commonly, and there's a significant percentage of those patients that do have the hip impingement symptoms. Uh, thank you. Um, and Dr. Kenny, um, uh, every patient with uh, uh, hip impingement, we're going to have surgery. Do they need an MI? Do they need an injection, as you mentioned before? Um, yeah, it's very uh, critical to the evaluation of these patients that they have the MRI. And generally, before someone's going to consider surgery, they're going to need the, the pain test part of the injection. So we put the two together. We do the MR arthrogram, and they need the injection part of the MRI, so we instill the local anesthetic at the same time. Now, on occasion, a patient gets referred in where their, their MRI may have been done without an injection. And if we see all the typical findings and the labral tears and whatnot, then it may not be necessary to actually repeat the MRI, but generally they will come back for that pain test injection. Thank you. 
Dr. Simonstad, uh, are most orthopedic surgeons familiar with impingement? And uh, the question is also, how can it be diagnosed easily? If a patient comes to you and there's uh, just a diagnostic, one diagnostic test you see will be the most significant? Well, it, it, it's becoming more and more commonly understood by orthopedic surgeons around our area as well as throughout the country. Um, and to answer your second part of your question, um, the single most important test is actually the one Dr. Kenny outlined is the selective injection. Obviously, you need to have x-rays that support it and an MRI, which also supports it. But it's absolutely critical that the patient achieve relief of their pain from the injection into the joint itself, which indicates that there's some cause inside the hip capsule uh, emanating their pain. And so that is, if I had to say one test is the most important, it's the injection test for me. But MRI are very important in x-ray as well. Sure. Uh, Dr. Simon said, that's a question for you. Uh, Frank asked, isn't hip resurfacing losing favor recently? Um, it's, there's been some articles uh, in the literature about some of the problems related to hip resurfacing. Um, but I, th I don't know that it's actually losing favor. Um, I think that it actually needs to be applied carefully. And actually, the articles that were written were actually simply outlining some of the restrictions that were recommended two or three years ago relating to small females and uh, the risk of fracture of the femoral neck is higher with small females. Also, patients should have selection in regards to their BMI. Patients of a BMI over 35 are not good patients for this surgery, either through the trochanteric flip or through a posterior approach. And so what we're seeing now, I think, in the popular lay press is actually some of the information that a lot of us surgeons knew that this operation is not for everyone and you do have to be selective. And it's generally for younger patients. It's not for older patients that have poor bone or osteoporosis. Those operations are best done with a total hip replacement. And so generally this, patient, this is for younger patients. But it's for patients that want to have activity levels that are more aggressive than with the total hip. Thank you, Dr. Simonstad. I think we're out of time now, and I'd like to thank the audience for joining us here today and supplying questions for us. I would like to extend a special thanks to our patients who agreed to have the procedure videotaped. And I'd like to thank my colleagues for joining me here tonight. Thank you. Good night.